coming in now. Um, you know, we, we usually have the, the events here up in the, in the poetry room. So to give you all still a little taste of the bookstore, I'm actually broadcasting from Lawrence Ferlinghetti's office. So here's Woo. Lawrence's office right here, little, little City Lights flavor, just to get you all in the mood. Um, yeah, and we're continuing with our, um, with our City Lights Live um, to celebrate the works of authors we know and love uh, with readings and discussions and forums throughout the month of July and August. And uh, I want to say that City Lights is really happy uh, to have finally reopened its doors to the public after all this time away. I um, want you to know that we're following strict SF Health Department guidelines. We aim to make our reopening as safe as possible for the public and our workers. Because you know what, people, we, we really, really missed you all. And I know that the bookstore missed having people inside it. Don't want to sound like a San Francisco hippie or anything like that but it's the stone cold truth. The bookstore missed you and we're, we're really happy to be open back again and uh, having you all visit. So please come back around if you haven't come to visit. We got the guidelines, the uh, masks are uh, a requirement, the uh, uh, disinfecting of the hands and all that. So we're open Monday through Saturday, through Sunday rather, 12 noon to 8 p.m. Um, so come on by, come check us out. We miss you, like I keep saying. As many of you know, uh, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. And even during these times of the pandemico, we've continued to publish in the tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's dream, his vision, his seminal pocket poet series. We're also really proud to be publishing literature and translation like uh, Silviano Ocampo's books that we recently published, translated as well. Um, and we're also real proud of our lineage of progressive political books that we published. Uh, this year, we're really proud of James Tracy and Hillary Moore's new book, No Fascist USA, the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and Lessons for Today's Movements. Also, uh, the new book by Stan Cox is amazing, Green New Deal and Beyond, and uh, really proud of the new poetry book by Ali Warren as well. So there's a bunch of other books. Uh, to learn more about the books that we publish, as well as our upcoming events, please visit, visit us on our social media platforms we're all over the place instagram twitter facebook pages if you call us on the phone we'll even answer the phone our events are also listed on the city lights web page and you may also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates about city lights releases as well as upcoming events tonight though y'all man we're so excited and delighted to have with us uh robert mailer anderson and friends he's got a good group of friends with him tonight Celebrating the release of the new graphic novel, Windows on the World, Woo! authored Woo! by Robert Mailer Anderson, together with Zach Anderson, beautifully illustrated by John Sack, published by the one and only Fantagraphic Books. I got my Fantagraphic shirt on tonight. Normally it's City Lights, but, but it's a Fantagraphic t-shirt tonight. This book is amazing, y'all. Um, it has received much deserved praise. Uh, Ishmael Reed, describes windows on the world as a much needed and fresh look at Latinx life. And Jonathan Lethem says it's a stirring piece of narrative art with a graphic eloquence conveying both intensity and true compassion. Ain't that the truth, y'all? So we're hoping uh, you're gonna purchase a copy of this book to help support Robert, and help support Fantagraphics and to help support City Lights. We're gonna be posting a link to our retail portrait in the chat function of your screen you may make the purchase at any time throughout the event. And now a few more words and then I promise I'll shut up, but I got to introduce the guests tonight, the very special guests. First off, Robert Mailer Anderson, the San Francisco Public Library Laureate, as well as a novelist, screenwriter, producer, and activist. He's the author of the Northern California literary classic Boonville. And tonight he is joined by some very special friends, uh, the illustrator John Sachs, who is a US and UK based artist and writer whose comic books include La Lucha and Iraqi Oil for Beginners. Uh, John did an amazing uh, job of illustrating this book. And also joining them will be Jacqueline Obradors. Ms. Obradors is an actress and has appeared in numerous feature films that include Six Days, Seven Nights, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, yes, Tortilla Soup, A Man Apart, and Unstoppable. She's also appeared on the television crime drama NYPD Blue. I love that show, man. Also joining them will be Jay Walsh. Jay plays vocals, guitars, and piano for the musical combo Douglas Fir. 
man, y'all are getting a plethora of people tonight. I hope you're, I hope you're, you're giving the jazz hands for these people because this is, this is a serious uh, group that's been assembled, man. Our guests are going to be taking questions tonight too. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of the evening. Please use that little chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask the author, qu author's questions. Put little questions on there and if they're, if they're PG-13, we'll ask the author. Maybe if there are, we'll ask them. We'll, we'll see, we'll see. We'll pick out questions from the list. So enough of my talk. Without further ado, everybody, welcome everybody to City Lights Live and welcome Robert Mailer Anderson and friends, y'all. Give it up, give it up, give it up. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great to be here uh, virtually and here in Boonville. We're actually in Boonville right now. Um, it would be much better to be in City Lights, uh, my favorite bookstore in the world. Um, speaking of radical thought, for a while, uh, to bring Boonville back to, to, to City Lights, my, I started writing for my uncle's uh, Anderson Valley Advertiser when I was 15. And during some of the heavier periods of the Redwood Summer and other um, unpopular thoughts and uh, uh, opinions that my un uncle published, um, City Lights was the only place you could get uh, the Anderson Valley Advertiser in all of California. Um, and so Lawrence uh, and City Lights has is, is, is always been there for us. So I do hope everybody buys this novel um, and, and, and in, in any other novel. So uh, because uh, the bookstores definitely are hurting right now and we, we, we all need to do all we can do. Um, and I just want to thank everybody here. Uh, I'm looking at everybody on the screens here too. So it's great to see John who's in London and Jacqueline uh, who's in uh, uh, Los Angeles and uh, we're going to start, um, as, as people may or may not know, Windows on the World um, is based on a screenplay that my cousin Zach Anderson and I wrote. Um, and it's a major motion picture now out on uh, VIX and Amazon Prime and Google. And it really, you know, attempts to try to deal with a, a lot of questions and uh, demystify, in some ways, the stereotypes of, of immigrants uh, in general. And there's a, there's a big brown-black alliance in it. So we're really happy that the novel is out there right now um, as we try to change hearts and minds and, and the narrative so that people get out and vote on top of everything else and do it from a humane place. Anyway, uh, Jay and I, right here in Boonville, wrote a song that uh, was ended up being covered by uh, uh, David Hildalgo from Los Lobos. And it's the uh, opening song uh, for the credits and the, the ending song. And uh, we, we thought uh, in the spirit of uh, City Lights, because we always like to bring a little music into the, into the gig. Um, we'd like to try to do our kind of original rendition. Uh, it's a little more country-esque, I think, but this is our anthem. Inside of us all. Inside of us all. Ladies and gentlemen, Jay Walsh. There are 
are no borders that can't be crossed. There is no soul who will be lost. We will march at any cost, because it's in inside, it is in inside us all. Yes, it's in, in inside, and yes, it's in, in inside. Yes, it's in, yes, it's in, yes, it's in inside, it is in inside us all. Yes, it's in, in inside, and yes, it's in, in inside. Yes, it's in, yes, it's in, yes, it's in inside, it is in inside us all. It is in inside, it is in inside of us all. Woo. <laughs> so this is the easy part now. Uh, we're going to read a passage. Thank you very much, Jerry Walsh. Um, from the book. And it's actually a section that was cut from the film. Um, for whatever reasons, in terms of mostly pacing and stuff that, that, that didn't work for our character. Um, but it is a scene that I always really, really liked. And we were super lucky to have uh, Jacqueline um, do this scene. And I, and I really think it's kind of missed from the film. Um, and so it's, uh, it's uh, great to have it back here with uh, John Sachs' uh, kind of amazing work, uh, you know, giving it a, a different feel as well. Um, we do need someone to read the gallery owner. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to the right here uh, and wondering if there's anybody around. Who oh, knows? what? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is there some kind of reading going on? There's reading going on. What a strange coincidence. Like City Lights, we have uh, uh, people walking in who are in our pod, often uh, writers themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Daniel Handler will read the part of the gallery owner tonight. Um, and then I think Oop. if, whoops, got a little martini. A little sloppy early on here. Uh, Jai, I think our assistant will get us the, the graphics now and move our way through this with the lovely help of Jacqueline Overdoors. Let's do it. Do we want to introduce Jacqueline? I did, Jai. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn. Is that memorable? There we go. All right. So the scene takes place uh, in New York, and our hero has found himself uh, looking for his father who disappeared during 9-11. Um, and his mother swears that she saw him getting out of the building uh, alive. Um, he worked at the Windows of the World restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center. And so she's an unreliable narrator, but the son takes his savings, crosses the border, looks for his father in New York, and is living on the streets right now when of one of the many windows on the world he sees, he comes across an art gallery. And this is that particular scene. That's Quetzalcoatl, the god of civilization. Have you seen the show? Um, I think your name's not on the list. Why don't you come inside with me? Margo! In the old days, they used to let you finish your drink. Mwah, mwah. Who's your gorgeous friend? My name is Fernando. May I take your bag, Fernando? Oh, don't worry, honey. He's got his eye on my checkbook, not yours. Now, if you don't mind, Fernando, I'm going to borrow Margo. I was on the roof when the second plane came screaming over my head. Well, Mike's best friend worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. Weren't you there, Larry? Shit was falling everywhere. People were screaming. I just ran. I just fucking ran. I knew you wouldn't disappear on me. So they get swept away to Margot's pad in, in the Upper East Side. Can I take a shower? Help yourself. <laughs> mm. Mm. I bet you could get used to this. 
slow down. I used to be like you. Young, beautiful. You are young and beautiful. My husband took my youth and beauty. My heart, my family, my soul. I was an art student in Mexico City, sketching every day in the Museo Nacional. Dino Saturnino Arran. Ugh, I became obsessed. And there was this one painting, El Reboso, where the woman in it looked just like me. That's what my husband told me. He had a good eye. But he was a successful art dealer, not an artist, an American. All he knew was how to buy and sell. Where is he now? Not here. We were married and I moved to Los Angeles, 1,800 miles, and he wouldn't let me go home. He said, I married you, not your family. Everything was new. I was young. Time's, time goes by so fast, and then it goes slow. I would talk to my mother and she would say, when are you going to visit? When can we visit? We miss you. And I would lie and say, soon, Mama, soon. And then on my 21st birthday, she wouldn't talk to me. My sister got on the phone and said, why'd you make Mama cry? I said, I didn't make her cry. But you did. Yes. My husband kept me traveling on his arm in his bed. Social events, openings, exhibitions. That doesn't sound too bad. It's hard to be away from who you are. Beauty can open doors, but then they can lock behind you. I wanted a better life. I wanted to paint, I wanted children, I wanted my family. He just wanted things. And without painting, without children, without my family, I became a thing. Something for his shelf, something to fuck. An object to take out and put away as he pleased. So you left him and went home? By the time I got there, it wasn't there anymore. Your mother didn't forgive you? My mother died. Go home. Go home. You don't belong here. Go home. Uh, hey, I, I didn't get my cheesecake. I'll have the front desk send one right up, sir. Room 2301 didn't get their cheesecake. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Jacqueline. It's fun to hear you, it's, you do the words. It's, it's, uh, it, it's fun. Takes me back. It takes me back to the hotel room for sure. Yeah. What a beautiful view that will never be shown. The penthouse of <laughs> William Vale. What? The penthouse of the William Vale in yeah. Williamsburg, New York. It's so beautiful. It's funny because it was the other thing that we lost, aside from the, a really interesting scene, uh, was the production value of that of that place and the big and the sots of the big city. Yeah. We, intentionally, you know, we were on at the ground level for so much of the film. Uh, uh, and then that was one way for Fernando to see this wider world of suddenly of somebody else that had wealth in New York. Right. It's pretty interesting. That one window that just, you know, they can see it in the novel now. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks to John. Thanks to Although it is, it is based on another hotel. I think it, um, what's the really, I can never remember the name of it, the really posh one at the end of um, Central Park. Not, I'm, I wouldn't even say Trump's name right I know, I... <laughs> no, no, not that one. <laughs> That's not it's, posh. No, 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 it's close by. It's around the corner. I can never I remember. said the same it. thing. I didn't dare go there, Robert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the one that Metropolitan takes place in, that film? Uh, 
Is it the Ritz Carlton? No. No, no. Four Seasons. Four Seasons. No, Four a, Seasons? I don't think it's the Four Seasons either. What's the other one? It's right there. Anyway, that's what it was based on? Yeah, yeah. I did a little, I did like one day in New York where I went to as many locations um, per the script and took as many photographs as I could. And it was a really insanely hot day. And I got, I went into that hotel to try to take some photos of the interior, but I was just sweating buckets. Um, and I didn't end up using a lot of the photographs, but um, yeah, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice place. And I used, um, I think I used Google, Google Street View or Google Earth to get kind of an above view and then just made it nighttime, yeah. basically. Was that the day you visited set before that? Yeah, it was. That was, yeah, I was only in New York for like 12 hours. And that, that like evening on set was just so hot. I mean, I just couldn't stop sweating. Yeah. Well, you should have gone to Mexico with the film. I heard that was... Oh, <laughs> Mexico is the only time I've ever seen, you know, when it says uh, temperature, you know, 78 degrees feels like 79. You know, you're always like, why do they, mm. who uses that? And what does that mean? And we were down in Mexico and it said uh, 106 degrees feels like 142. Like that, <laughs> the readout was. Real feel 123, real feel 123, which is hot enough. Oh my God, it was nuts. I was in a, I, I went to church to get out. I mean, that's how bad it was. I actually went to church to get in, to, uh, get a little shade. Um, it was crazy. We had, we had to kerchief ourselves with ice and stuff the whole time. Yeah. And in New York, it was hot too. And it was interesting because it was supposed to be fall. And I mean, it kind of can get hot there, but you know, mm. it, was, it, was, it was a challenge. New York was, filming in New York was a challenge, let alone trying to draw New York. Mm. What was your biggest challenge, Jacqueline? My biggest challenge? We kept pushing your days. Remember that? I remember that. You did, you did. So yeah, my biggest challenge was, you know, just trying to get around the city and explore it all. I was going to museums and just, looking at a lot of art given, you know, that the character was doing a lot of studying of, of museums and stuff. So I, I got to take advantage of, of all of that. So that was, that was nice. There was you nothing hard. Palm Spring. Did you get to go to Palm Springs for that? Did they... For the movie? Yeah. Oh, which they didn't, they didn't mention in the credits. Yeah, I have a movie out called Palm Springs right now. And um, no, we did not shoot that in Palm Springs. Uh, it was shot out here in um, Aqua Dulce and uh, it looked like it was very deserty, but it wasn't quite in Palm Springs. And then I think they did a day in Joshua Tree, but that was shot just out in, you know, not too far out of LA. So it wasn't Palm, in Palm Springs. I keep waiting for Josiah to come back here. Did you cut him out, Jai? Are we? Uh, I don't think I'm the host anymore, but let's see. <laughs> let's see. Who's driving this train? Exactly. There it was. I was I was silenced. Uh, I, I had to I had to be I had to be given permission to uh, to speak with the unmuted button. That's the. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just I'm just kicking back and listening to all you wonderful people talk. This is a, it's a really sweet. I, I feel like a fly on the wall kind of thing. But yeah, man, it's a. It, it just sounds like a really fascinating process. But can can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, can we unmute Vic? Vic Bullock as well is in the room. We should unmute him because he has he has lots of stories too. Is Vic here? Vic is here if he if he wants to be unmuted by whoever okay. is by City Lights. What's your question, Josiah? Why they try to unmute Vic? So you well, the, 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 the unmuting is the process. You got okay. Vic. <laughs> Vic, hold on, Vic. Um, so the thing is, you know, with me, it's usually you usually hear about the book coming out and then the movie. But in this case, it was the yeah, movie and then the book? The culture and the society. And the so what happened was uh, Zach and I wrote this screenplay. Actually, people said it was fairly prescient, but it was, um, we wrote it in like 2002. And we okay. sold it to Max, and then we went into turnaround and blah, blah, blah. But uh, oddly enough, um, the issue of immigration never went away. Nobody really ever talked about who was in the building during 9-11, undocumented people. Um, and, you know, the, the further sort of disgraceful kind of racist attitudes uh, towards Latinos uh, in America 
became, if they could, they, you know, they, they're coming to another height here as we see the civil unrest in the streets for Black Lives Matter. It's, you know, it's, it's very similar in terms of, uh, you know, immigration issues, you know, pa parents getting, you know, taken away from their, their children at the border and up here in Boonville, you know, I have friends too, you know, they, they won't go to church or schools or jobs at times because of ice raids and, you know, DACA is on the line. So, you know, you look in the media and I believe that Latinos make up 18, 20% of uh, the U.S., they're really about three to 5% of screen time. And something like half of that is, you know, wait for it, criminals and maids, you know, that pushes it to about 80%. And so um, after the election stuff, uh, my wife of all people said, you know, you, you gotta make that film. And we had political friends that said, you gotta help us try to change the narrative and give us something to talk about because it's not changing. So, I started in again, but right around that time, I, uh, I, I thought it would make a really good graphic novel. And I was lucky enough to get in touch with John. And I figured if things got into turnaround again, we would either have a graphic novel or we'd have like this storyboard that would be outrageous. You know, Hollywood's very afraid of making anything that they can't see first and foremost or doesn't exist in another form. So John and I started and it took twice as long and the book was twice as long, I believe, right, John? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it was other quite a process. And, and now it's kind of the, the perfect form as, a, as the producer, you know, I planned it all to come out just all around the same time, really, you know, uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you got so <laughs> lucky. Um, but because it's such a different format and, and there's such a different take, uh, it, I don't think one is exclusive to the other. It's not like reading uh, uh, the novelization of WW and the Dixie Dance mm. Games or, you know, uh, ET, especially since John and I started before we had anything going in terms of no, there was no cast or anything. Uh, I believe, you know, I, you know, that, you know, there were some people that we wanted in the film or something. And I, I think, you know, Edward James almost was always an inspiration. And so I think his likeness in a way, uh, is, is in the, no, uh, no, uh, the graphic novel as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how it started. And, and John and I, you know, worked uh, quite a while. Like he would, he would get together basically to every 10 pages or 30 pages. How did it go? And then we would kind of have editing, like art, art directing sessions or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Robert, Robert gives good feedback. So um, it's, hard to, it's hard to edit a graphic novel as you go because unlike a Word document where you can just delete words and add things or subtract. Um, Rejigging a page of drawings takes some time. So you can always add things and Robert's got a really good eye for detail. Um, so we would go in and, you know, add little bits and bobs here and there. Um, but yeah, it took, it took longer than either of us had envisaged. Um, and like you said, when, when we embarked on this, like the film was like it was a bit of a I don't know a bit of a dream <laughs> and, um, the production of the film came on I was trying to remember today like what page I was on in the making of the graphic novel when I visited the set and I I can't remember but um but yeah and then the, the film was produced while I was still working on the book and that was interesting too because then we also made a few you know things in the film that i thought were 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 were, were good towards the end and we we actually incorporated those actually i think mm -hmm. because yeah had, and i, and I uh, deliberately didn't watch most of the film while i was making the book because i really i really wanted wanted the book to kind of um have its own kind of style um and aesthetic i guess um so i've i've, I've watched the film like now but it was like i kind of withheld that while i was making the book did you connect with the story right away john i mean i know your other works they're definitely for me they're like social justice graphic novels in a lot mm. of ways man so i think you know and robert's sort of explanation of this now so was it kind of a natural fit for you when you saw when he yeah when he, it it was yeah when robert got in touch with me i mean it was just sort of out of the blue and he pitched the project just in an email. I mean, I still remember the day when I got the email. And um, I mean, I didn't know, I, I didn't know who Robert was and I didn't know what to expect from the description of the story. And, and politically I thought, okay, this could go in many directions. So I'll just have to like read the, um, read the screenplay first and see where this, you know, where this goes. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, immediately I, I read the screenplay and it was, um, I felt it was a really moving story. And I, and I could see how it would make a, like a really potentially compelling graphic novel. So yeah, it was, I was all in um, from the beginning. <laughs> I really liked La Lucha a lot and I liked the lines uh, of it and I saw it and I was like, wow, okay. And I, you know, this, the social justice thing, I thought, well, maybe this guy would be interested. Mm. That's, you know, and at that point too, you know, we, we'd had, we had the screenplay, uh, you know, was done. And so, you know, I was actually, I was trying to work on a, another novel I was, and, and then I moved to Paris, actually. I left all this behind. <laughs> <laughs> So you got to have more stories for us about this. Come on, give us a juicy one. It's six thirty. It's it's technically it's dark out. Let's hear a, let's hear some kind of a some other story there. So uh, behind the behind, behind the, the scene. novel or, or or the the, the writing of it or uh, I mean to me one of the interesting stories about writing it was when I was taking Miramax's notes. They were all you know you know pretty good. Uh, but when we were trying to shop it the first time and then the second time, which was say, you know, seven years later, uh, people really started to say stuff like, uh, well, it's so interesting, this rancher, you know, uh, there's a point in the book when he's crossing the border, he meets this rancher and they're like, you know, that's so interesting. And what if, you know, what if the movie starts right there? What if the movie starts right there? And what if the rancher has like a kid that died of like cancer and he sees this kid, you know, that's in essentially his backyard in the desert. And, and, you know, you cut that other first part of that stuff, like the family in Mexico and him, you know, and, and the whole how things are okay in Mexico, even though the dad is, you know, uh, a, a abroad, right? It's broken the family in some ways, but the patriarch is alive and they're, you know, they're an adjusting family, right? And you want to show show how the impact is rough on them just to not have a patriarch around, but then to lose him entirely, and then to lose the money coming in, you know, is a is just it was huge damage, right? Anyway, they're like, let's leave that behind and the crossing behind, because who cares? Um, and what if the rancher takes the kid to New York, you know? And what if the father doesn't leave, not because of the pressures and because of, you know, a, a post-traumatic stress of getting out of the building and, and having this horrible thing happening. What if, what if he's like dealing drugs and that's why he gets out? And so I would hear this in these rooms and it, like it really compelled me even more to, to try to make, make the film, the film that we wanted to tell the story that we wanted. Um, and, and Vic, I'm not sure if Vic is, is, is unmuted, but we did from the original, the one thing that got changed in the second kind of screenplay we went forward with was that we made Lou, the, the guy that helps, there's a gentleman that helps him, gives him a job washing windows, which is the net, the other meaning of windows on the world because he literally washes windows. And when it became my own devices, uh, we, we, made, uh, we made him Nigerian because that, that's what made the most sense to us. Yeah. And Vic, as my producing partner, was you know, all on board with that. That was. Okay, a I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I yeah. can. Yeah. In my dreams, Vic, I hear you still. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Vic. Yeah, I was still getting over the production value we lost in the scene um, when we cut uh, the penthouse with with Jacqueline. Not as much the room, but Jacqueline. <laughs> I know that view. That was a beautiful location for sure. These things oh. happen. <clears throat> That, that relationship with a, with, with a Nigerian Armando, that I really love that part of the book, Robert. That was actually, that was so, it was like another, uh, the, the immigrante experience into the other immigrante experience, you know? And it was like, a, I don't know, there was that camaraderie was really beautiful to see. That was always the intention. Uh, yeah. But we also thought, you know, when Zach and I sat down again, we thought, well, what would be more like, here's a person, you know, you think of, you think of the tragedy of 9-11 and the people that died, but we're not even thinking about this poor Nigerian guy. You got like five million dead inside of like, you know, six years and nobody's, nobody gives a shit who he is. He's just washing the windows. You know what I mean? No one cares about his tragedy, you know, and no one, you know, he's the kind of person that gets called scourge and stuff and, and worse, right? Like he's, you know, he's a black man in New York, 
you know? Uh, and, you know, he's holding up the economy. And, and yet he has this whole other side of humanity to him and his sorrow. And, and again, that's kind of what happens on Fernando's journey. He, because it's kind of a road movie in a way, as he moves through things, everybody is dealing with, with their own, you know, tragedy and sorrow. You know, we find out the, the love interest that she meets is, you know, his, her dad just died, was a cop that died. And, and Jacqueline has, uh, you know, had her um, uh, uh, sorrow of coming uh, to America and then not, be, you know, having to be divorced from her culture. We wanted to show that. And um, so everybody that comes into the thing has felt something. Um, and so, you know, that's a bonding force. And I think that's partially why the, the novel has been doing really well right now, as is the film, because we're, we're in another connective of tragedy, an international one. And, and as much as people would like to divide and to be in the little, little um, camps, you know, it's a tragedy that's taking place in the United States. But it's, a, you know, it's, 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 it's universal right now. You know, the, 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 the coronavirus is, is terrible. So it's linking, it's linking us all up. I just hope that we can do something well with it. But we were all linked before, you know? We just, we seriously do just have to start trying to empathize with other people. But, but that's my wobbly politics. I come from the old kind of <laughs> IWW, kind of, you know, one big union. And so, again, that's why labor really matters to me. It, all, it always has. Um, in terms of, of the stories and who gets to tell the stories. Um, so that was interesting. And we got the great Glenn Turman plays him in the film. And, and Glenn is, you know, just a, a special person and uh, has been around the civil rights movement. And his mother was good friends with uh, Lorraine Hansberry. And he was, you know, his first uh, acting job was uh, in A Raisin in the Sun. And he was moved, I believe, from Harlem. It might have been the Bronx. I, I, I forget. But he, he, got, he got moved into the village, you know, when he was a little boy. And he was, he was raised around a lot of activists and, and artists. And, you know, he, he's not let up in his political stances and in, in his search for sort of equity and, and justice as well. So it was a real pleasure, you know, coming uh, for having him on set and, 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 and making it all happen that way as well. You know, it's also like his character's a Muslim too, you know? We didn't, we didn't play that up exactly, you know? We, we didn't necessarily, you know, bring out the prayer rug or anything, but, you know, that's another, that's another kind of tidbit in there too. Of course he's a Muslim, you know? Uh, and yet he's the person helping, he feels his tragedy, he's an American. You know, we, th we thought all of those things were really important, but we didn't want to make like overt propaganda because that's kind of boring. Hey, Robert, yeah. do you remember that story that you told me? I think it was when the one day I was on set and you had met somebody because of the shooting schedule. I think it was like it had been a really long day. You were in a bar and you met someone completely randomly. Oh, that was crazy. Yeah. That was so weird. Here's a weird one. Um, this sounds okay. This is this is a this is a story where I get to be the winner. So this is a this is a tough story that way. But but since John brought it up, we had a thing where we were doing really long nights, and I was the producer as well with Vic. And so you get really about five hours, you know, off maybe maybe five to four. You're working 19, 20 hour days, and so Jai and I, my trusty assistant, um, decided that we really shouldn't be drinking that much or at all unless we could drink at this one bar in Brooklyn. That was our rule. Because um, otherwise we were going to go under because a shoot is really tough and you need all your energy and you know things go wrong. It's independent film and all of that. Um, so we're sitting at this bar probably 1 or 2 a.m. and this woman sitting next to me says, what do you do? She says, oh, we're doing making the movie. Oh, I'm in the movie business too. And I say, she says, what's your film about? I say, oh, it's about a kid looking for his dad after 9-11. And she goes, I love that. I love that. I love that script. And I said, well, I didn't really, you know, I go back into the pitch of the elevator. Yeah, but then he goes, and she goes, I know, I know. I love that script. I was like, well, it's not out. We're making it. And she said, I used to work for Miramax. I read that script. And it was always my favorite script that I had there. And I tried to push it forward after uh, uh, Miramax was disbanding. That's what happened to us. You know, there was a, there was a, uh, the New York branch versus the LA branch once the, once Disney bought them out or something. And she said, I always remember that. I'm so happy. That was, that's, that's always been one of my favorite scripts. 
and unbelievable just sitting right next to me uh, at 2 a.m. That's a pretty straight at Maison Premier. Mm. Yeah, that was a pretty good one. That's yeah. a New York moment. We felt good for like three days and then we, you know, we're <laughs> That's a New York moment. Hey, I have, a, I have a question from the audience. Uh, Heidi asks, a uh, question for the creators, is grief a part of this book and film? Well, absolutely. That's what we were saying uh, before about sort of like a trauma and, and, and tragedy, everybody carrying their sorrow. So it's, it's definitely a, a kind of a dissertation on, 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 on grief and how, you know, for Fernando, of course, you know, we think it's like he's searching for his father, but he's, he's really ser sort of searching for the ways to, to move forward in the world, as are all of these people. And so how do you, how do you get past your particular grief? And again, the answer is to come into unions with each other, you know, to follow your heart, to be vulnerable, you know, uh, uh, the Lou Glenn is, you know, the character is, is vulnerable enough to ask him to work, you know, to take a chance on this kid and to bring him into his house. Um, you know, he's, he's vulnerable to try to um, say who he is to this other, other woman and she's vulnerable to let him know who she is. You can see it. There's an interesting part too where they, the healing of, the first healing for New York happens. There's a, 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 our New York, New York scene in there where, you know, we wanted it to be like the Casablanca Marseille uh, uh, scene. And that's the healing. There's a, there's a character that's, that's a kind of a bar fly and he sings karaoke and he starts trying to sing New York, New York and he stumbles and everybody thinks it's really sad. And then one of the um, other uh, patrons in the bar stands up and starts singing the song. And then the whole bar you know, all the patrons come together and, and sing it as if they're recognizing their own suffering and, and picking each other up. And, and that's sort of what the Fernando character does for his father. You know, the father says, you found me, but it's not, it's not the physicalness that he found. He found, he found the moral center of himself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was, that was a very interesting time when we were doing that scene. We had two people that, and, that one woman lost a woman, one of the extras had lost a, uh, her daughter in 9-11 in the mm -hmm. building. Oh, and I said, hey, how you doing? Because this woman looked kind of down and she said, I'm okay. I said, oh, okay. And she goes, you know, my, my daughter was in the building. I was like, what? You know, and I could see where it was leading. I was like, did she get out? And she was like, no, she didn't. She said, so this is really helping me, you know, get through that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, wow. And we had that in New York. I lived in New York for five years. And when we were making uh, the vigils everywhere that are in, in the book, you know, people put the can, uh, you know, candles out and teddy bears and pictures. Um, I was waiting for actually, you know, every other New Yorker to tell us, no, you can't do this or to kick it or it wasn't like that. And not one, not one. We had people coming up and asking if they, if we, if they didn't mind if they could convene there, if they could pray there. They asked mm -hmm. us what the film was about. And they said, thank you for not making it about the firemen this time and about so many other people that are in the building and stuff. Uh, and you could see that just the set deck uh, was, was cathartic for these people who were dealing with their own grief. And so, yeah, we, I hope the film and the, you know, the graphic novel can, can, can help people deal with their, their own grief and the trauma of, I mean, let's face it, crossing the border? I mean, unbelievable trauma. We all think about, you know, a nation of immigrants, but what a rough run. And we know it doesn't go very well for mm. a, a lot of people. And then you're in another country, you don't know the land, I mean, everything. It's just, what a traumatic experience on top of the other traumas of falling in love and parents dying and things going wrong. Like every, you know, nobody gets out alive. And so, you know, that, yeah, it's definitely about grief, but it's also about like a kind of optimism in, in, in the human spirit. Zach and I are very kind of Capra-esque, if it really. I mean, you know, we like that. We like the story of the transformation where, where it's, it's within somebody to become better than the sum total of his parts. I like that story. That's, my, that's the story I like, so. I think um, illustrating grief is also quite challenging as well. <laughs> and yeah. trying to convey um, complex emotions through illustration is, I mean, that was, I think that was probably my biggest challenge in a way for this project because this was the first time I'd done anything fictional and and also researching 9-11 um, was revisiting 
collective grief. Um, I, I had to, I suppose one of the advantages of um, doing a graphic novel was I could take certain liberties that would have been really challenging to film, such as, um, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but like, um, you know, illustrating 9-11, uh, like Collapse of Towers, and viewing hours and hours and hours of um, tourist and um, news footage from that day and just taking hundreds of screenshots. So, I mean, that is kind of how I construct pages, especially when it's, when I'm telling a, a story about something that's, that has happened in real life, I will do a ton of research. Um, but there were definitely times when <laughs> it was like, it was quite intense. And it was the same when I did um, the book uh, La Lucha, when I was telling the story, piecing together uh, real stories of people who had been assassinated um, at the behest of um, cartels in northern Mexico. Um, it took a lot of research, but it was also incredibly sad and depressing. Um, so yeah, I think that personally that was sort of my, my biggest challenge was to try to convey um, a range of emotion through these characters. And it's still something I'm, I'm trying to get better at. <laughs> no, I... The impetus for the whole story was I, uh, I had read also all of the, um, the New York Times ran a series in real time of phone calls coming out of the building before people, before the building went down. And I, I stayed up all night reading that. And then in the New York Times, uh, I believe the the magazine, there was a photo essay of people from around the world, you know, like uh, uh, Syria, Morocco, Guatemala, and there were families and they were holding pictures of their loved ones that they said were in the building. And, and I lost it. I was just, I was, I was really, I was in tears and, and just trying to fumble my way. And I told Zach, I showed him the thing and I said, you know, this is our story. This is, this is the story that we need to write right now. Because we, we, were, we were thinking about what to write in terms of a screenplay. And then, you know, all the rest kind of started tumbling out of that. But yeah, it's, it's difficult. You also feel like uh, it's incumbent on you to, you know, if you take on something like this, to try to do a good job. Yeah. It's, that, you know, those, those are, moments, even though it's fiction, it's real people. Well, those moments when he's, when he's looking for his dad and the, those things that he's navigating, Robert, those parts, that, that, and then the way you illustrated them, John, they were... Those for me, those were the deep moments in the book. I mean, you know, that, that, that maddening process, you know, we're living in the modern times, but you still got to go through the holding up a picture, right? And hope that someone happens to walk by. I mean, yeah, that, those, those, those scenes, man, that y'all did, that, that, was, that was for me, that was like, bam. Boom. We also had an interesting thing here, being, uh, went to high school here in Anderson Valley and, you know, a lot of uh, 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 Mexican immigrants that I went to school with and friends and families and stuff, you know. And so it was always interesting too when someone would come across uh, here that just had a whole different kind of life or job somewhere else, you know? And just the, the instant second, you know, second class citizenry of anything based on skin color and where you came has always just been just, it's just such a horrible fucking thing. And we, 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 we had an interesting scene that's in the graphic novel again, that, that's the, it's not in the film, where he goes to this uh, hotel, he kind of finds his way into this hotel because he, he kind of uh, looks like he could be a hipster because he's an attractive guy, he's got these boots on. And he says, oh, I'm looking for a job, you know? And the woman says, uh, kitchen or maintenance? Right. He says, well, back in Mexico, you know, I, I did a job like yours, you know, he's behind the desk. And she says, as he's escorting him out, as you can see, you're not in Mexico anymore. And, and uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of moments in that, the, 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 uh, in, in the graphic novel and in the film, where we're, we're trying to express a kind of experience again, in grief and trauma and sorrow and difficulty of, of just being alive, just trying to, to, to patch it all together. Well, you also touch on that aspect of, um, and I'm speaking as a brown man here, man, you know, Los Estados Unidos don't have a memoria. So when one group sometimes gets here, 
they'll forget what they went through. And like, you see him go through it. Like, you know, this is obviously a Latina lady giving them shit. Excuse me for saying that, you know, but yeah. like, so you, you guys conveyed that amazing, you know, in, in several moments, you know, uh, so it was, yeah, man, it comes across deep. It really does. It does. Well, the other thing, like it does, nothing has to be, you know, this is a, people were talking before about um, like appropriation and who's stories and stuff, but um, I am like ninth generation California. So I, I have, you know, um, you know, family that actually fought against the US invasion of Mexico. And although I clearly present and identify as super Anglo here, Mr. You know, uh, Mr. Gringo, but um, you know, the, the politics and the working politics of California alone, of, of, of it once being Mexico, and then, and, then, and then being for no real reason, you know, like just taken or seized in a way, you know, conquered, if you will. And then the whole, the whole movement of when we use that labor, or when we bring in the Chinese, when we bring in the Japanese, you know, like it's, it's and, and then how sometimes the, the next generation, you know, will want the door shut too, because they, they know how hard it is in terms of like, like jobs or workforce or getting pitted against each other, you know, for minimum wage jobs or not. I mean, minimum wage is not the minimum you can live on. It's the minimum someone can fucking give you to do that job, right? Like that's what the minimum wage is. And so, you know, you, you, you know, we're not, we're not immune to that. My cousin, Zach also is a, uh, uh, He's half Chinese. He was born in Malaysia and raised Chinese uh, in Boonville as well as is, a, is an interesting, you know, outsider kind of perspective. And so we've always had kind of outsider perspectives. My father ran a home for juvenile delinquents too, where I was raised. And so a lot of, lot of uh, underclass people, if you will, uh, in there who also, again, I would say half the people we had were, were, were black and brown. So, uh, Kind of easy stories, right? There's no research for that. Zach and I didn't get like <laughs> we didn't. There was no there was there was no research about 9-11 specifically, but we didn't really research anything else. I mean, you know, you just you make you know you go from the kernel of truth and uh, that you know and then you you know then you dress it up. It's it's an amazing work. It really is, man. It really is. Yeah. So I gotta uh I think is anyone else in our in our audience have any questions for the creators? We're coming. It's sad to say we're almost at the end of the evening. So here's your chance. You want to ask anything? Maybe ask if Robert's wearing pants. Anything? <laughs> last 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 question. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Anything? Anything's up for grabs. We're almost at the seven o'clock hour. But um, man, what an amazing book. And if you all haven't purchased this yet do so immediately because uh i mean I, I i'm a i'm a i'm a comic guy so i i came to i went to it automatically but it really is a, an amazing work of literature robert and, and john and it's just it, it's really exceptional it's an exceptional thank work you. thank you guys for doing it and again if, if, if people have bought the book buy something else from city lights everybody can always use another copy of how to give somebody That's on top true. of anything else there's a there's mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of fiction and nonfiction that needs to be read. And there's a lot of great graphic novels out there. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, I know people have a lot of time indoors. It's, it's, it's better than, than all the computer video game time. No doubt. Unless, of course, you're watching Bosch or Palm Spring with the wonderful Jackman Overdoors. <laughs> <laughs> or NYPD Blue, the reruns. Come on, I'm, you know, that's, that's what got me. And actually, if you buy the book, you get a free screener right now uh, via City Lights. We'll give you a, a, a download via Vimeo. Yeah. I think it's via Vimeo. We'll give you a link. You can watch the film free or try to watch it on um, Amazon.com or Vix. Um, Amazon well, that, Prime. that answers, uh, uh, Julie was just asking where can people see the film? So that's, that it's available on Amazon. I will say the Vix people were unbelievable. They got on early. They knew exactly what the film was and they're like the largest Spanish language like uh, streamers. Those people are amazing. So shout yeah. out to, to Rich there. And again, shout out to, to Vic, who's, who's, who's uh, on and off here on the call, my producing partner hmm. for making it all happen and staying with this one to the end. Um, and shout out to um, Fanographics as well. Oh, um, Fanographics is wonderful. They've been wonderful. brilliant. And the, this, the book itself the, as an object is um, just amazing. Like I'm so... They're the New York Yankees. I'm so Yankees. pleased. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm so... the New York Yankees of, of graphic novels, man. They, they do a great... Great. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Stephen Holbert, who was our liaison to them, 
uh, uh, really hit it out of the park. Because we did this on spec, which is not really the way to go about a four-year project. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know in some ways time and and, and energy and uh, you know we, we were we were really graced with 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 fanographics coming through at the end we got we got lucky mm. yeah uh, they really are an amazing comic uh, comic institution graphic novel institution so. absolutely so, so man so, you know, uh, it's funny I, it's funny that we go back it's fun to back all the way was Valeska where I, I met you originally. Just well, that was where you met me because my ma's uh, Mexican restaurant was over there and I used to go into your cafe and nod off in the corner. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, man, but that place was an institution, man. We could do a whole show on that place because you, you, you had the reading series going on on the second floor. You tango dance with Petrina. Or, <laughs> you, know, you, were, you were a class act from the get-go, man, for sure. And yeah. well, Apparently a lending library as well. <laughs> yes, man. But it was, it, that place was special. Truly, truly unique, unique. Well, wow. City Lights, City Lights is that, you know, for us. We were so lucky to have that engine and that heart in, 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 in San Francisco, yeah. so. Well, no, we're not, we're not going anywhere. We're here. We're waiting for y'all to come in and visit for sure. And, and I want to thank everybody for, 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 for making this such a wonderful event. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for the night. Uh, everyone, y'all give some jazz hands to Roberto and his friends. Thank you all. John Sack, uh, for actress Jacqueline Obrador, Jay Walsh, and uh, Daniel, <laughs> aka Lemony Snicket, <laughs> was there too. So uh, there's no hide. There's no hide when them aliases. But um, I'd also like to thank you all, wonderful people, for attending and supporting City Lights and Robert's uh, amazing project. So uh, if you haven't purchased copies of this book, uh, please click the links that are in the comments or come on into the store and buy one. To learn more about upcoming events, please visit our website, www.citylights.com. And stay tuned for more uh, uh, City Lights Lives event. We're really excited. Tomorrow we're going to have, oh, I'm going to pronounce his last name wrong. I feel terrible. Eric Utney, his longtime activist and publisher, is going to be in conversation with Dwayne Elgin. And in August, we'll be featuring, oh, yeah, Joshua Bennett, Ishmael Reed. And in the fall, we're going to have visits from Hector Tobar. Roberto Lovato and Harry Conzra. So y'all, please keep coming back to the City Lights live event. Keep visiting us. Keep literature People alive. should check out if they haven't. Uh, Ishmael Reed's The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda. I was lucky enough to play a part in that. I got to play the, 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 um, the villain, Ron Chernow, in the first like eight readings uh, back at, uh, at the New Yorkans Poetry Cafe. And, and oh, his take on it is super important. It's kind of one of the leading kind of points right now in terms of like, you know, the new Hamilton and actually, you know, Black Lives Matter and how, how we need to really think about the monuments that we're taking down. Yeah. And we should take them down. <laughs> really, definitely. You were the villain in that, Robert? Always. Always the villain. <laughs> Heck that. <laughs> all right, y'all. There's something else for y'all to check out. And also we've been included some links in the comment section for some uh, immigrant activist rights groups here in the Bay Area doing some really good work. If you want to delve into that, I would encourage it. So y'all take care. Thank Gracias, you. Robert. Gracias, Robert's Thank friends. You Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, all Good night from City Lights Books. Good night. It's Florence Ferlinghetti's office. Woo!